This is Entrepreneurs Get Visible, the podcast for people who want more impact, influence, and income. I'm Anna Parker Naples, and I'll be sharing with you proven methods from leading entrepreneurs that help you get visible as an authority in your field. Because anything's possible when you get visible. Welcome to episode 102 of Entrepreneurs Get Visible. This is an episode with a slightly different twist. As part of my 100 episode celebrations, I wanted to share with you content that was of a different style. And today I am joined by two of my closest friends to let you see the inside workings of our businesses, how we've created the success that we have. We recorded this as a little party for ourselves, and I hope you're going to enjoy having that fly on the wall feeling with everything we're talking about today. I think you'll learn some insights into how and why building a business that touches people's lives really matters. One of the things we discuss in this episode is the power of connection and working in a really focused environment. And that's what's possible with a mastermind. The doors to my next mastermind are now open by application only. So if you know that you are an action taker or you are ready to take action and you are wanting to accelerate your results because anything's possible when you get visible, go and check out the sales page at www.annaparkernaples.co.uk forward slash mastermind. The link is in the show notes and all the details on how to apply for one of those limited spaces to come on to my next six month mastermind are all over there. It's not one you're going to want to miss. And now, let me introduce you. In fact, I'm going to let them introduce each other as you join us for our podcast party. So today on Entrepreneurs Get Visible, I think we're going to have a lot of fun with this one. As part of my 100th episode celebrations, I wanted on release day to bring to you a few episodes that are slightly different. So number 100 has been a compilation of listeners out there, people who listen to the show, who have called in and let, let us know what, what the impact of listening to this show has been. 101, which was also released today, has been a compilation of 20 of my guests that have been on so far. And then now you are being privy on episode 102 to a very special podcast party. So I'm joined this evening, um, actually a week or two before this all goes live, by my absolute best friend in the world who I only met within the last couple of years. And without these ladies, I doubt my business would be as strong as it is today. And it's kind of vice versa as well. They're smiling at me now because it is very much the same. So what I've given, the brief I've given these ladies is that tonight is a bear all session where we are going to probably share things in a slightly different way than we would in a standard formal interview setting. And as I said, when they came on this Zoom call, that tonight is my first ever three-way podcast, except I said it in a bit of a ruder way than that. (laughs) I have a glass of wine in hand. One of the ladies here is in her pajamas and she'll talk about that. And we've all had very, very busy days as busy mums who are homeschooling and as entrepreneurs. So without further ado, I am going to bring on Catherine Morgan and Caroline Strawson. But they are not going to introduce themselves. They are going to introduce each other and tell you a little bit about the other one's business. So Catherine, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about the incredible Caroline Strawson. Oh my God, I've got the giggles already. (laughs) But I have a glass of, well, a cup of tea actually, not a glass of wine. So I think I'll be all right for most of this. But cheers, Anna. Anna's raising her glass of wine. So thank you so much, first of all, for having me on. Like, I feel really privileged talking about podcasting and entrepreneurship and being a mom and all those kind of things. But so Caroline, let me introduce Caroline. So Caroline actually has been on my podcast too. And oh my gosh, how do I even just begin to describe the powers that this woman has? Like, she has a list of qualifications as long as your arm. Like, she's a multi-award winning EMDR specialist, rapid transformational therapist, She's just, for me, one of those unique people that you ever, you only meet one of Caroline. There's only one of Caroline. And she's just my go-to person for anything that is related to how I feel, if I want to feel good about myself, if I want to release some self-worth, some of that, you know, the little inner critic that comes out and I'm just having a really bad day. She just has this wonderful, beautiful way of making everything seem like 
just that anything is possible and I just love her. So yes, that's Caroline. <laughs> hey, and Caroline, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So introduce Catherine. Tell us about, about Catherine Morgan. Okay, so when I think of Catherine, Catherine is this kind, gentle soul, but with this drive and passion and a trailblazer, really in the financial world. So Catherine wants to make money accessible for everybody without the emotional impact of that. So she helps us understand our emotional connection with money, whether that be whether you're an entrepreneur, whether um, it's your business, whether you are, you know, just that career person, or even somebody who's just at home. She's really about making it not stuffy. And as she's even sat here in her pyjamas this evening, (laughs) as such, because she wants to make it so that people know money isn't a dirty word. Money isn't something to be scared of. And again, the qualifications that she has, not just in the financial world, but other aspects of the emotional side of all of this. I know she's so passionate about bringing that psychology of money, that therapy into um, her world as well. And I know she's going to change the face of money and finances for everybody moving forward. Oh, thank you, Caroline. And I think that's where the connection is, like originally was for you and I. So yeah, so that connection then, what would be great is if we kind of described how we met, because we are now undeniably close in terms of business support and in terms of friendship. So we we now talk almost every single day, even during lockdown, via an app called Marco Polo. Keeping them in business, absolutely. <laughs> but actually, this is the first time that we've all hopped onto a Zoom call that we've actually actually been able to speak all at once. With Marco Polo, we leave video messages all day, every day. Tell me about this lead magnet. What should I do in my funnel? Um, <laughs> my skin's terrible. I can't do a Facebook Live. <laughs> all, of, all of that real stuff. And Anna, Catherine and I are normally in the bath as well. Is is Catherine because I, I I'm northern, um, originally from Manchester, so I still say bath. bath. So whenever Catherine does her message, she says, here I am in the bath. <laughs> everything as well so Anna's not normally in the bath no. as such and and again we're not in the bath together we are in the bath on Marco and we can't Polo. see Let anything it's not it's not really bearing <laughs> all it's just from the neck upwards your listenership Anna's just gone through the roof <laughs> <laughs> but the funniest so Marco Polo is a video app where you leave messages all day and we love it because while I'm making a cup of tea and I'm pottering around my kitchen I can be downloading what's going on in my day and getting feedback and vice versa but one of my best moments with that is that I was absolutely in the middle of getting changed, but I wanted to reply to Catherine because she needed a response <laughs> about something. You know what I'm going to say here. And I was really, really pleased because I said to her, oh, I'm only, I've only got my bra and pants on, but I managed to do, do the video from the neck upwards. But what Catherine pointed out to me weeks later was that I was in front of mirrors so she could see my pants and my, my lacy knickers. The lesson there is always wear good underwear no matter what the situation, girls. Absolutely. You never so, know when you're going to be caught short. <laughs> so we now have... we. I, I, we've, I think we've been really good friends for about 18 months. And I think certainly certainly from the day, we, we were actually all attending Jojo Graham's event. And I think that that day kind of just, I don't know, there was something special that happened that day. But how did you two meet? Because you'd met before I came on the scene. Uh, we met at a networking event, didn't yeah, we, Yeah, it was a women in business um, networking event in Mills and Keynes, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, it was. And, and again, I think... You just get a vibe off people um, that you can connect with and a good energy. And and immediately I was drawn to Catherine with her positive energy and that gentleness, but again, with that real drive and ambition um, as well. And we just connected straight away, didn't we? And actually what's really interesting for me is looking back, and I, I think that was three years ago, Caroline, it was in the January. And I remember when Caroline was talking about her business at the time which was around um protection for women making sure women's finances were protected so it was obviously a subject that was close to my heart anyway but there was no 
competitiveness edge between the two of us at all. And I remember going out for a coffee, which is what you do after networking meetings. You get to know people. And we had a coffee chat. And I think I booked out an hour in my diary. I think three hours later, we were still talking and could have continue talking. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that's how we originally met. Yeah. It was, it was great. And I think, you know, I think other than we as having to get our children from school, like you say, we would have just carried on um, talking. Yeah, and, and it was across the board as well, as, as we find between the three of us, you know, we don't just talk about business, we talk about personal things. And, and that level of support that we have for each other, I just think is so important for women in general. And of course, for us in the entrepreneur space too. So I met Catherine again at, at a local networking event. And it was while I was running Inspiring Mummy Club. And it was the first in-person event I'd ever been to networking. And actually, my, my dad had had a serious heart attack and my, my whole personal life was in turmoil as a result. And yet I still rocked up to this networking event. And that's where we met. And I hadn't realized that you were a mum for some reason. So I, I noticed you and I thought, you're really, you're interesting to me, but it's kind of off my radar. And you, you told me afterwards that you emailed me to get in touch. And I don't know if I replied to you. Did I reply? <laughs> I don't remember. All I remember about that, all I remember about that is I remember vividly you walking into the room because I remember you had jeans and boots on, like three quarter length, like mm-hmm. just below your knee boots. I remember thinking, oh, I've always wanted to wear boots like that. I've never been able to rock that look off. Like, and I remember you, you were very feisty. I remember you just having this real <laughs> presence about yourself which I'll be really honest with you, was a little bit off pretty when I first met you, Anna. I was a little bit like, oh, she looks like she's a strong woman. Like, I'm not going to mess with her. And, um, and and that was really interesting for me because ordinarily I probably wouldn't have been um, attracted to, mm-hmm. not physically attracted, obviously you're gorgeous, but, you know, <laughs> um, especially now I've seen you in your pants. But you know, <laughs> it was that because I actually I was really badly bullied at school. And I had massive confidence issues about myself. So I would have found that quite, I'm not even sure what the word is, but like, I wouldn't necessarily have been, but for for whatever reason, I felt really attracted to contact Mm. you afterwards. Um, And I think I remember you telling us about your story, being on the red carpet, being out in LA. And I was like, oh, this woman sounds really interesting. And I remember you sharing some of your story about being in a wheelchair. And I was like, wow. Like there's something underneath this lady's story that I really just want to get to know more about. I remember, Catherine, that I, we'd, we'd met at that event and you saw, I sort of knew who you were. And then I started seeing that you were doing similar things to me. You were turning up doing Facebook Lives and you were talking about the thing that mattered to you. And I knew nobody else doing that kind of thing. So I remember you kind of being on my agenda, if you like. Oh, that's interesting. What's this woman doing? Where's she going? And because we'd met, and I at the time was running Inspiring Mummy Club, and I decided, not knowing anything about webinars at all, I decided I was going to start doing free webinars. Whereas now, for me, a webinar is a sales tool and a marketing tool. Obviously, there's still lots of value, but I hadn't, I hadn't got that even in my mind. And I actually wrote, re- reached out to you and I said, would you be willing to come and do a money mindset webinar? Because I had some money, um, money mindset hypnosis tracks that I wanted to deliver. And that's really the first time we properly spoke. Uh, and it was really early days for both of us in our business. And then... When I saw that Jojo Graham was holding her event, Jojo's also been on my podcast several, a couple of times, actually. I remember I saw you tagged in on Facebook that you were going to the event as well. And you messaged me to say, or I messaged you to say, I'm getting the train because we, we're on the same train line. And you know, that morning you, I said, yes, I'll come and meet you. Because you said you were traveling with a friend, I very nearly didn't get on the train with you. And so did because Caroline was there. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's so interesting to think again. And you've both highlighted it on various occasions here. Catherine, when she met you, Anna, and then you about that. That as women, we create these stories in our head around things about whether we're going to do something or not. Mm-hmm. And just thank goodness you both connected and that you got on the train that day, but Anna. I've, I actually felt really nervous. And I think there's something about this that we'll get on to in a minute. I felt nervous because historically I haven't had great relationships with women. I have had good friends. Of course I have throughout my life. But 
often, and this is a lot that I talk about in my in my book and on my podcast, often I felt on the outside of those kinds of things. And I can remember sitting down and feeling like I was supposed to be at that table. And I knew, Caroline, that I was supposed to supposed to know you. And I can remember after the event, us being in the taxi, in, in a taxi, leaving the event. And it was actually your book had just been released three days before. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I've met somebody who not only says they're going to do something like be an author or a speaker, but is absolutely doing it. And obviously a book was on my high on my agenda. And you actually invited me to your, your book launch. And I can remember thinking, does she mean that? Does she mean I'm welcome? And I thought I'm going no matter what I'm going. And I can remember in the back of that taxi that night, we all discussed how much we were charging. And it was the first time I had had an open conversation with anyone else about what I should charge, what I shouldn't charge, what other people were charging and the thought processes behind it. And for me, that's been incredibly powerful. Not, you know, making that money comfortable, which is very much what Catherine is all about. I've just found the email, Anna. Oh my I God. Sent to you. Did I reply? <laughs> and you, so I actually downloaded one of your lead magnets, Anna. Um, and I remember you posting me. <laughs> I remember you posting me. Your lead magnet was how to ha- find out how to get happy. And you sent me a little sample of your essence oils. I remember oh getting them through the post. Oh and my, my email for you, Anna, was, can we have a one-to-one? We met at the networking meeting last year. Oh. I love what you do and think we have some great synergy. <laughs> Did I reply? Oh, lovely. Isn't that nice when you look at me? Yeah, but I didn't reply. Probably not. I probably went into the junk folder. <laughs> I don't well, think I saw your email. Let's blame spam. It's so interesting. I'm the same as you, Anna, with this. Um, And again, that that whole, I mean, my middle sister always has said to me, Caroline, you're already crap at choosing friends. Because again, coming from that place of lack of self-worth from my childhood and beyond as well, attracting toxic friendships, toxic relationships, um, again, it was that whole trust thing about being with other women and opening up to that. Because again, I'd been really burnt along the way from my own perspective too. So it's really interesting, again, I think from us being honest with each other about that. And again, for other women listening into all of this about how important it is for women to have those connections, but actually sometimes how women can be quite cruel, Mm. not necessarily coming from a place of intention to be mean and horrible. It's coming from a place of their own fear. And that can come across if you've got your own self-worth issues with someone attacking you or behaving in a certain way towards you and you really taking that at at face value other than its projection upon uh, onto you I think think that's a real friendship lesson in there actually Caroline you've just shared because that that whole vulnerability piece for me is like I don't think I've ever been as vulnerable with anybody as I have with you two both in my personal life and business and I think when you open up that vulnerability you open up everything it's like you unlock this door to Mm. Um, even when you're talking about something that feels really painful or you've learned a lesson or there's been something that's really challenging your business, having that communication and vulnerability open and available to you to just talk it through gets it out of that, you know, out of that confused mind or overwhelmed mind. And, and that's just been so powerful for me. I can remember for a long time feeling really a bit lost with friendships. And feeling that I just didn't have the people around me who really got me, who got that I was ambitious and that that was okay, who got that I wanted to earn a lot of money and that that was okay, who got that, yes, I was going to do something and go at it full throttle for the pleasure of going at it full throttle and that 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 was okay. And I think it's been a massive learning curve. I I can remember when I was sort of coming into the online space, seeing lots of people posting about, oh, they're business besties. And I remember thinking, gosh, that's so, I find it so cheesy. But there was always that jealousy, I think. And it's, it's been, without a doubt, the fact that we, we, we are in communication all the time about the emotional and mindset issues that sit behind what we're doing in our business, that we are constantly, constantly supporting each other and pulling each other up. And that's the interesting thing about the dynamic of what goes on between us is that we are all skilled in mindset work in a slightly different way. And not one of us lets anything go. We'll always say, look, 
but always with love, never to criticize, never to put down, always to help grow and expand. I did not know that friendships like that could really exist. And, you know, that's that's why we're here celebrating tonight, because one, I'm it's amazing that I've taken an international successfully podcast to 100 episodes in like six and a half months. But I couldn't be doing that without the support of not only you girls, but but listeners and people that we're connected with. And what I've loved watching is that I feel like we're on a journey of growth together and we're also lifting other people up together, which is really exciting, really exciting. And for those of you listening, Caroline will shortly have her own podcast. What's your podcast going to be called, Caroline? Now, I'm asking that in my group as we speak, actually. I put two people in my group today to get suggestions from my audience as to what they would like to think. And I've got suggestions coming through already. So, okay, uh, so watch yeah, this I know space. you and I will be working. Absolutely. And I know and I can't wait to be working with you with that, Anna, because, again, from my perspective, you know, I know we're bestest of friends, but equally so, I like to choose the best in the business to do things with. And I can't think of anyone better in this podcast space at all to help me create my podcast and make it a success than you. You are the podcast queen, literally, quite literally. Made me blush a little bit, that one. Uh, but Catherine also has also has a, a, an incredible podcast, In Her Financial Shoes, which is such a breath of fresh air in the in the investing and money space that you're in. So I've got, I've got some questions now that have come from some people that in our audiences and also that I've put together. Uh, so my first one, actually, we're going to start with a typical day. And by a typical day, I don't mean the one that you want everybody to know about. Give us a run through of what your exact day was like today as a busy entrepreneur who has children at home. So Catherine, let's start with you first. Okay. So Wednesdays, me, my husband and I have basically been tag teaming through COVID-19. So every Wednesday I have an entire day on my business and then he goes into the office one day a week. So we tag team and the rest of the days we kind of just, just do our best with whatever we can. Um, so today, what do I do today? So I actually had quite a relaxed morning. Normally I go straight into work mode at when I wake up, I normally listen to a podcast when I'm getting ready for, for, you know, putting my makeup on and doing my hair, et cetera. I normally always listen to a podcast, but I didn't this morning. And I decided to um, take a little bit of time out to message a few people. So one of the things I always try and do when I wake up in the morning is to express gratitude. Now, it isn't always specifically related to people. It might be gratitude for my financial situation, gratitude for the weather, gratitude for my health, but something that I can be grateful for. And this morning, I actually uh, messaged three people that have been uh, helping me um, through a various number of different ways over the last week. And I just sent them a lovely message just to, to say thank you for being there and just to really be grateful to have them in my life. So that was the first thing I did this morning. And then I was preparing, actually, just finishing off and running through my slides um, because I'm currently delivering a financial coaching training program out into the industry and it's the first cohort. I've got 20, some double check that everything was, I was happy with everything. And then I put two podcast, podcast guest experts into my diary. And I spoke with my VA, my virtual assistant, and got her to come up with some really good titles for those podcast episodes. And then I did my training for two hours. Then I had a spot of lunch. Then I played on the new dance game on the Switch with my <laughs> six-year-old. <laughs> Then I sat down on the couch feeling quite tired. (laughs) And what else did I do this afternoon? Oh, and then I've just been spending the last two hours editing videos on iMovie, um, answering some emails, preparing for a meeting I've got tomorrow, and then getting in my pyjamas ready for this evening. So Catherine deliberately chose, when we were deciding what we were doing tonight, she deliberately chose she was going to wear her pyjamas. I was like, actually, I'm going to put some makeup on because it feels quite exciting. I'm going to talk to people. (laughs) Um, But that's a big part of your branding, isn't it? And how you choose to show up online. So Caroline, tell tell us, go on, Catherine, talk a little bit about why you do that. And then we'll ask Caroline about her day. Yeah, no, just very quickly on that, actually. I think one of the things I wrote down actually about a big lesson I've learned in business and not just in business actually, but in my personal life is that I've spent years trying to be somebody else, trying to be who I thought I should be and trying to be who people thought I should be. 
and, and showing up in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then being really confused as to why people don't really know me for who I am. And a lot of that was to do with the lack of self-worth and lack of confidence. So when I first doing, started doing Facebook Lives, I was doing a lot of them in the evening because that's when my children were in bed and they were asleep and I could get some you know, time on my business. And so I just used to rock up in my pajamas and it just became a bit of a signature thing. It was like, actually, if we're going to be talking about money, which is still a very taboo subject, let's do it in our pajamas. So I've yet to do a speaker event on a stage in my pajamas. That's maybe coming. But um, um, but I think it, it is really important to just be yourself and not try and be anybody else. But that you know, judgment, shame, guilt, all of these emotions are very, very intertwined into the work that we do and how we put ourselves out there and getting visible and all of those, you know, those things that stop us sometimes is, is what people are going to say and how people are going to judge us. So, yeah. So a very conscious decision from my part to do that. Mm. Uh, really um, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, go on, Caroline, talk through. I was just going to say, I've done a few of mine in, in my dressing gown and everything as well. And I remember, and I've, I remember telling both of you when we actually, my, sadly, my mum passed away 11 years ago. And when we were deciding when she was being cremated, what to dress her in, it was like dressing gown because it was, again, that comfy clothes of how I've grown up. And again, I think just what you're highlighting, Catherine, it's it allows you to feel comfortable in your skin so that then when you're having those tougher conversations or talking about things like money, mm. people can feel much more relaxed about it as well. So Caroline, talk us through your day today. Okay, so it's been a really busy day, which is no different than normal as such. So I was up at 7am uh, this morning. So obviously we are in lockdown. Now my children are 15 and 12 and I feel very blessed, particularly when I speak to you regularly, both of you, because I think I have it very easy. They're both you know, Maddie is being homeschooled, but her school have been amazing with that. So she literally is having a school day online. My son is um, doing his GCSE. So he's going to be that GCSE year, not doing those exams. So he's completely finished now. So he kind of is relaxing on his Xbox and actually getting fit and healthy. He's doing a lot of exercise at the moment and getting into doing some weights and stuff. So they're both very, very self-sufficient. So my day started, um, again, like Catherine, when I get up, I journal, um, I do my gratitude and I also do a lot of high performance stuff. So I set my intentions for the day. How do I want to feel at the end of the day? Because again, our brain doesn't know what's reality and what isn't. So I create my day. How do I want to feel when I get into bed at night and I create that and anything that's going to be drawing me away from that during the day, I get curious about that question that and bring myself back into alignment. So I take some time to do that. I get up, I get dressed. And again, I'll catch up on the Marco Polo sometimes as I'm getting dressed, always feeding my mind, listening to something. (laughs) What are you going to say that? I was going to say that takes some hours because between us, we can all talk. (laughs) <laughs> I, know, I know indeed yeah if we miss if we miss a day it's like we're, we're on uh, you can do times two speed on Marco Polo and sometimes it's like ah! <laughs> so I can just to try and listen to the world and stuff as well so then I had a call with my virtual assistant at 8.45, just for half an hour. And then at 9.30, that was my first client. So my first client was a CEO of a company and it was a pure high performance coaching session. And then I've had seven other clients beyond that. So I've had eight clients today. I've done a lot of EMDR um, today as well, which is is amazing. Um, I've done some parts therapy with a lot of my clients today. In between that, going out, getting something to eat, checking in with my kids, giving them a cuddle, catching up with them, sitting with them, having that connection. I've sent quotes out to people, caught up on my emails. My business is purely online. So catching up on Facebook and on Instagram, replying to people, my posts in my membership, in my group. And literally, I came off my last client at 740 I had a message from somebody saying, can I have a quick chat with you because their friend is in a domestically abusive relationship. So they needed some advice. So I had a quick call um, with them. Hence why I haven't even had a chance to get into my pyjamas. Have you had your so dinner though? In my... No, not yet. It's not yet. Um, but I will have something when I finish. I had I had quite a late lunch. So I'm, I'm okay, yeah, okay on all of that. So, you so know, my, my yeah, day... It's, it's 
it's, it's, it's interesting listening to you girls because I start my day by journaling and a cup of tea. Nothing happens until I have done three pages of freehand writing biggest load of rubbish that I ever write and I write it every single day without fail and then I go over to I use um oh, the daily greatness life planner and it has prompts every morning again about setting intentions and um and then I use the business planner for the rest of the day for what I'm doing what's happening when and what's going on in the business and I, I really love those um particular journals but I'm a bit naughty I do sleep with my phone next to my bed. So the first thing I do after I've said good morning to the cat, the dog, my husband, whoever else, is I check Facebook. I do. And I know it's naughty to do it that early, but that's kind of how I get my connection as well. And I know it is something that I want to make sure that I I, I stop doing at that time. Um, but this morning, again, homeschooling, my son is now with homeschooling hasn't worked through their state school so he's now attending a private online school and I helped him with a geography lesson at eight o'clock this morning um whilst also tweaking a landing page whilst also downloading (laughs) some audio for this 100 celebration then went into I had a new client today who came on board for business strategy for three months but we started with some NLP work because I believe that if you're going to build a business you've got to get below there's no point building a business that isn't going to fit you and your lifestyle and actually what your real purpose is. Then I had a strategy call with a mastermind client. Then my son and I made macaroni cheese at 11.30. So, you know, that was different, unplanned, but he needed the macaroni cheese. So that happened. We then had to tend to one of the hamsters. So that happened for a while. And then I cracked on with the rest of the day was about working out some strategy things for a launch for me. And I had two podcast interviews with other people. Um, then I had to walk the dog. Then I had some things to sort out for the children that weren't animal related. And then I actually, I sat down, had a cup, a cup of tea and was then thinking about tonight. What are we going to talk about? How's this going to go? Am I going to have a glass of wine? And yes, I did have a little bit left in the fridge. So that's kind of been my day. But I thought, I think it's interesting for us to share how we're balancing being mums, being human and running businesses. Because sometimes it's a challenge, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it can be a challenge. And I think, again, society makes it a challenge sometimes that, you know, you've either got to be this perfect mum. And if it's almost like you can't be a successful female entrepreneur and still be a great mum. And I totally disagree with that because I think you can be an amazing mum and an amazing entrepreneur. But I think as society, sometimes they put limitations upon that. You can only be either or. And that for me is absolutely not true. You know, you can be an amazing mum and you can be an amazing entrepreneur. Yeah. I kind of think, um, to add to that as well, that I think society definitely has an influence on us, but I think more than anything, we we get in our own way of our own success. Because even for those people who are not mums, you know, there's always this balance, isn't there? Always balance of priorities and where do we focus our time and our energy. And that's why I love actually all three of us get quite intentional in the mornings. And that's quite a, a, a big learning, I think, from all of our morning routines is I, I'm not a natural planner, like a bit ironic as a financial planner, but I'm not naturally a planner. And so I really have to focus on my intentions for the day. Otherwise, you could just get to the end of the day and then think, oh, nothing, I never got anything done that I wanted to get done because the focus wasn't there. You know, where the energy goes, focus flows, you know, or, you know, it's, it's you've got to put your intentions out. Otherwise, nobody else is going to do that for you. And often we just get in our own way. So I've got a couple of questions here that have come from um, a Facebook post that I put out to say, you know, we're prepared to bear all what you want to know. So the first question is then, what's made the one difference to your business as you are now being recognized and winning awards? What's made the difference to that and that recognition? What would you say to that, Anna? I actually, I, I see winning awards as a game and I've won multiple awards and been finalist for multiple awards nationally and internationally regionally I see it as a game to get visible and that doesn't diminish how pleased I am when I win or when I'm a finalist or when I'm a nominee but the recognition only comes when you throw yourself in the ring correct and I I think as well like you say with the awards again in line with your message there Anna and what you were just saying about getting visible 
if you win awards, it allows you to be more visible so you can reach more people with your message and your purpose. And like you, that, that's what I see awards for. It's that whole kind of people notice you more, they listen to your message more, and you can reach more people. And but you wouldn't, that, you wouldn't win those awards if you didn't put, throw your ring in and say, I deserve that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that boils down to, again, that A, the belief in yourself. So mm-hmm. I would say in answer to that question, the biggest game changer for me was actually belief in myself. Um, And then from that awards perspective, if you've got belief in yourself and you have such a passion and purpose with the message that you want to get out there, the awards aspect of that just becomes really part of your business strategy in getting your message out there and getting visible to as many people as you possibly can. Yeah. What's your take on that, Catherine? So I think my opinion has changed with awards. I think when I first started applying for awards it it wasn't strategic it wasn't a game for me it was more for that external validation Mm -hmm. because I wanted to feel the recognition externally and having worked with both the two of you I realized that actually nobody else can give you that external validation or they can but it's not as meaningful as if it comes from within yeah absolutely awards changed for me when I started winning them um I kind of didn't even believe it because I didn't have the self-recognition so although I was getting the external validation and people were saying oh yeah this is amazing what you're doing I wasn't feeling it I wasn't even believing it and I'd actually shy away from it when people would say congratulations I'd just like I'd play it down Um, and that's always been quite prevalent for me in my life because I always wanted to be noticed So that when I was being noticed, I was pushing it away because it wasn't familiar to me. Mm. So I talk about this with people's finances is that we all have a, like a comfort zone and anything that sits outside that comfort zone stretches that boundary. That's where fear is, but it's when we push through that, that all the magic happens. So for me, actually winning awards now is more strategic, probably more what you were saying, Anna, it's more of a game. It's more a strategy of, well, you know, Hey, I'm going to get visible because if I want my mission and my purpose to go out to as many people as possible, I need to get visible in order for that to happen. It's interesting you say that and you see that that progression for yourself. Because actually, when I put myself back to the first time I was up for an award, which actually was one that I didn't, I had no say in, in whether I was put up for it. It was put up for by a producer when I was working in the audio space. And I so wanted that recognition. And I can remember working with an NLP, um, an expert NLP practitioner. And she said to me, why is recognition so important to you? Why is winning an award so important to you? And this was back when I was not doing anything anywhere that would have meant I could have won an award. And I said, well, it's like a dog with a bone. Once I've got it, I'm just going to bury it and forget about it. But I want it. And that's really interesting. And so now it's like once I've got to that level of being recognized and being accepted that I have value, external validation, it doesn't matter to me anymore because I've had it and now I can grow, if that makes sense. But there's there's a whole evolution piece. There's a whole evolution piece in whether you feel ready to put yourself in that ring in the first place. So, so next question, what is the one thing you need in order to succeed? I'll start with Catherine first this time. Ooh, the one thing to succeed. I think... For me, the one thing would be just to get started. Like, so I think a lot of what has held me back in the past and holds people back from what I see and from what I hear is that ability to just get going and get started and just see what happens. So what I see a lot of is that perfectionism mindset of oh well I, it, it's got to be perfect because what are people going to say about it or how you know people no, no one's going to buy that program no one's going to buy that membership or whatever it is that you're thinking of doing and I think that in business you just have to get started mm-hmm. and take every single possible opportunity that comes your way um whatever that is it, I, I, rem- I remember the first example I had of that was when I was asked to be a speaker on a stage And even up until the day before I had that speaker event, I was going to call in sick literally the night before. I was like, right, what can I say? What, like, maybe I can pretend I've got a cold or something or the flu. And literally, I was so petrified. And I I practiced for weeks. I 
I hired a, a rather trained actress to help me present it. Um, I also hired a, an ex BBC One presenter to critique it. Like I, you know, invested a lot of time and money into getting myself ready, but I spent so long trying to get it perfect that it actually held. I mean, I, I did go on stage. It didn't hold me back, but it very could have, you know, easily mm. could have done. And so I think it, to really think about how you're showing up for yourself and what can, you know, everything that you do, there's a lesson in everything that we do. There's a lesson to grow. There's an opportunity to grow. But if you keep your mind open to opportunities and just make those small steps, you know, progress over perfection, that for me is probably the one thing that I would say based on what I've done for my own business, but also for what I see Mm. from other people. Um, great advice. What about you, Caroline? What's the one thing you need in order to succeed? Well, I think as a starting point is because, you know, I see lots of people investing in business coaches, etc. For me, it's the belief that you can actually succeed. And with what Catherine was talking about, so I do a lot of parts therapy with, with, within um, my scope of practice. And just when Catherine was saying things like that perfectionism, procrastination, the self-sabotage, you know, we don't want to live our life having that part of us. And we see that that part of us very often as an inner critic, very negatively, but actually it's a protector part of us stopping us from stepping out because the potential is we might feel an inner wound about ourselves. That might be, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. You know, I'm I'm invisible. I'm not important. So from a parts therapy perspective, it's really working on, well, what is that wound potentially that that protector part is coming up to protect you from feeling and working on that? Because when you work on that inner wound initially, the protector part won't need to be there. It won't need to bring up perfectionism, self-sabotage, procrastination, because there's no wound that needs protecting. So what you can't see, those of you listening, is that Catherine and I are nodding because we know this from our own experiences. Okay, so I've got some some slightly quicker fire questions. So the first thing is, what's been your biggest fangirling moment in business? Maybe someone you've worked with or someone you've had on a podcast. Who is the coolest person you think you've met or connected with since you've been in business? (laughs) They're both putting faces at me now. Wow. Whatever? Whatever. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Okay. All right then. So this this is going back many, many years as such, but it always stuck with me. So many years ago, love traveling. I actually worked for Virgin Atlantic many years ago. So I've met Richard Branson on many, many occasions. And again, the inspiration around all of that is great. And he always carries like a little book around with him as well. So for me, just learning from him. Are you well. in Richard Branson's little black book? Is that what you said? <laughs> well, I, I, have been, I have been in his house. And, and, <laughs> and you've been quite quite close to his feet, Caroline. <laughs> what goes on in Necker stays in Necker. Oh That's a whole other story. So Richard, if you are listening, we're only going to tell you that story if you take all three of us to Necker Island. <laughs> <laughs> as female entrepreneurs uh, in this space. <laughs> okay this this one then is for Catherine you what's been your least successful launch and what have you learned from it oh okay before I answer that though you've got to ask you've got to answer that question Anna <laughs> that you just asked Caroline um, I think actually and I kind of feel a bit funny about saying this because by the time I interviewed her I felt really on the level but Carrie Green i basically came into this space whatever this space is of realizing I wanted to motivate people and inspire people because I listened to a Carrie Green audio and I thought she seems like a normal woman and yet she is making a lot of money from putting audio out there oh my god I want a piece of that pie and I've interviewed Carrie she's been on this podcast I've been on her podcast it's coming out shortly and she's so normal and by the time we spoke she knew who I was because I'd raised my profile. I'd gone from nowhere to not anyone knowing me in those three years. And uh, and when you decide, see, this is one of my probably biggest teachings for other people is when you decide who you want as your peers long term, then you can make that happen. You can make that happen. And of course, I, I 
it would be very hard for me to catch up with the size of audience Carrie has because she's always going to be five, six years ahead of me. But that was a big, that was a big moment for me that I can talk to someone who I guess I not idolize. That's the wrong word. I don't know that I do have any idols in that respect, but that I could change my life, my business and my connections significantly, that having that conversation was very normal and down to earth. What about you, Catherine? So, um, um, what was my question? The question is, um, yours was going to be, I want to hear your fangirling moment first. Oh, I don't really have one. That's so bad. I need to find one. I don't really have one. Um, well, okay, let's move on. So let's t- tell us about your least successful launch and what you learned. Okay, so at the end of last year, December 2019, I launched a uh, Self worth to net worth course, and at that point, I'd ran a couple of five day challenges. So I run a five day challenge called Plug Your Money Leaks. So I'd run it a couple of times that year. It was really successful. I, I used it to launch my my membership model, and I got a huge amount of transformation for people in, in a five day challenge. So I thought, right, I'm going to change it, and I'm going to do a five day self worth challenge. Now, the challenge itself was brilliant. I threw loads of effort into it. I turned up twice a day, did a Facebook Live. Um, people had some massive light bulb moments. And then it came to this moment of selling a, a high-end program at 997. And two people bought it. And at the end of that launch, I remember thinking, why hasn't this worked? All my other challenges have gone really, really well. Why has this not worked? Now, I don't really know the answer to that still. I can make some assumptions. Uh, One of the things that was very different about that launch for me is I did my challenge in my main group. I didn't set up a pop-up group. And all the previous challenges that I had done had been in pop-up groups. So that I kind of thought, well, maybe the engagement wasn't quite so high. But then I also felt that it just wasn't right for my audience. Mm -hmm. I felt that I was, again, trying to copy other people because I was seeing other people doing 997 launches I'm thinking well surely I can do that too I'm worth that you know I know that the content is amazing but my audience is very different and this is where for me my focus on my business changed so that it was about growing my podcast growing my blogs all the things that were high value free content so that I didn't feel bad when I then wanted to launch higher end Mm -hmm. programs and so again it's money mindset and even Mm. for me you know even money mindset experts you know they we all have blocks around money and for me that was just uh, I reflected on that and thought okay there's probably a couple of things that I would have done differently in terms of pop-up groups and things like that but actually I think I just wasn't listening to what my audience wanted Mm. and perhaps if I packaged it in a different way I probably would have got a, a different outcome So the way that you present your services is really important. The way you build your audience is really important. Serving your audience for what they need rather than what you think they want is also really important. So a couple of kind of key learnings in that for me. Really big learnings. And I I wanted to ask this question today because I think it's important for people out there because we are three successful women. I don't think there's anyone who could deny that in our businesses. And yet it's not been plain sailing. It's not always been roses. What about you, Caroline? What's been your least successful launch and what did you learn? Again, similar to really what Catherine said. And I think for me, the the biggest learning for this, and this was um, last year, of again, putting the time and effort into something and then just expecting it to sell. And, you know, one of the biggest learnings I think I've had is it doesn't matter how amazing your course is doesn't even matter necessarily if you've got a big audience, which I've got, you know, I've got a big Facebook group and a big following and and a fairly big email list. The process of launching, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I've got this great course, but the process of launching, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I expected that because I've got an audience I know what I'm doing and I've created this course I expected people to buy it now some did but again I felt really disappointed because I thought gosh the value of this and you know I know how it can help people as such but it really made me realize that you need to nurture your audience to build up to the sell as well and you have to be comfortable with selling you have to be comfortable because if you don't learn the selling component and we we are as individuals we all have 
big drive to help people. That's really the core of what we're doing. But if we're not learning how to market and we're not learning how to close, we don't get those results, which means our business can't grow, which means we can't reach the people. So I've had two, two, what, two ones, two um, launches that I kind of want to highlight. The first was very early on when I was launching Inspiring Mummy Club, where I literally rocked up into the online space, having had a completely different career where everybody connected with me, knew me as something completely different. And I went, buy from me buy from me. I've got a great product that could change your life. But nobody knew. Nobody knew me. I had no kudos in that space. And so it was like cricket and it was painful because I'd spent, I felt like I felt so alive with purpose. And so like I'm doing the right thing and this is going to change lives and it can't, it can't fail because it feels so right. But I had no idea. And then about 18 months later, I released a course called Potential Passion Profit for the second time. And the second time around, I got two people. And again, I hadn't titled the course in the right way. And I changed my audience very rapidly from mums to talking about entrepreneurship. So I hadn't nurtured the audience to take them with me. And I hadn't titled the offer for what people really knew they would get a result for. So I learned so much. But my God, for both of those launches, the tears, the, sh- the snot, the shame, the, the, the self-loathing that I've fucked up royally. And yet I hadn't because those things have led to me understanding, right, I need to fix this. I'm in this for the long haul. I'm not running away. This is not the end of my business even though I'd hoped for thousands of more pounds to come through the door because I wasn't going to launch for another six months. This is not the end. This is the beginning. So what do I need to learn? Who do I need to connect with? What course can I get on and how quickly can I get on it? But don't don't get me wrong, those of you listening, I wallow in a good bit of self-pity. And these days I have two incredible women who pick me up off the floor when I say, I can't go on. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I just, do you know what? One of the things I love about you, Anna, is your passion and your drive is so inspiring, incredibly inspiring. Because I have, you know, I have seen you when you were on the floor. You know, alcohol may be involved just in some of those. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's it's um, your passion and your drive and your commitment to the the bigger picture all the time. You're always talking about how this connects you back into the bigger picture. And, you know, often we talk a little bit quite, uh, you know, about source and connection and you know, some stuff that can be perceived as quite woo-woo. But what I love about you is you are so connected to source and your purpose and your passion. And I think that's what really makes you stand out as the leader. Yeah, I really do. I, I agree. And that, that commitment to learn and grow from whatever has happened. It's not a case of, you know, that's it. Even though in the moment we might all say that as such, there's that element of, okay, I haven't liked what has happened just now. What is the gift that it is trying to give me? How can I learn from this now moving forward so that the next time I do this, it's going to be completely different. And I think that's the key then for, you know, success in some respects is that you are you know, we learn from our mistakes, which actually enables us then to move forward and have better businesses because of that. I think that's my one piece of advice for people listening is that find the people who, when you are on the floor, devastated by how rubbish a launch has been, who aren't going to go, maybe it's time to give up. But instead, they're going to go, how quickly can you turn this round so that you can get up and do it again, but better? Finding those people, oh my God, changes everything. So you have to get out. You have to go to those rubbish networking events that you hate. You have to make sure you go to the right conferences. You have to actually, when we're finally allowed out, get on the train to meet the people that could change your life. Like, honestly, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Okay, so what has been the best, worst investment you have made for your business? Oh, goodness. Wow. I can tell you my best. Go like, on, tell me your best. So my best, the best investment in my, well, two best investments. One was Jojo, Jojo Graham's Masterminds. We love you, Jojo. We love you, <laughs> Jojo. I, 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 do you know what? what? I was saying this just the other day to Anna. I was saying that when we finished at, um, Jojo's first program, so we, when we all got on this train to London, just finishing off where we started this story, we all sat at this table 
And we all made this commitment before we w- walked in saying, we're not going to buy anything today. We're not going to buy anything. And all three of us walked out having spent a thousand pounds. We were like, oh God, what are we going to tell our husbands? Like, I remember saying to my husband, like, we need to cash in some shares because I want to pay to work with this lady. And I was so scared. And when I finished that first program with Jojo, I then went, Anna and I then went into a mastermind with, with, um, Jojo. with Jo. And with Jojo. And then I remember at the end of that thinking, wow, this is amazing, but not really actually recognizing the value in it until yes. about six to 12 months later. Because mm. the results weren't there. The results weren't there. Yeah. Mm. Because it, it takes time. Absolutely. So I always look back on that. I think that really helped me establish my business. Um, so that was the first best investment. The second one was not long after that. Because of the power of that mastermind environment, I was like, right, I, I need to join another one now because it was so good. And I, so I was like, that. coming to Rob Moore's. I've just been accepted. Go on, Rob, take Catherine. And, and that for us has changed everything. Yeah. Yeah. So Rob Moore's mastermind program um, was uh, like the best investment, the best four grand plus fat <laughs> that I have ever invested. So, so to put that in context, so in, in like a six month period, both Catherine and I, on the face of things, looked like we had successful businesses. We're very well put together women. We knew what we were doing. And, and, and what, to all intents and purposes, to the outside world, it would have looked rosy. For, to put down an investment that was 997, I actually lied to my husband about how much I paid. <laughs> because at that point, a thousand pounds was inconceivable. Inconceivable that I would spend that. And it's interesting now because I now understand the world that I've entered and I've understand what's out there and I've understand the value of learning and investing in how to work the entrepreneurial space and the value of the mindset stuff too. What about you, Caroline? What's your best worst investment or your best investment? I don't even think I, I don't even think about worst investments in all of this because I think it's all part of your journey along the way. And actually, if I add up the amount I've invested in the last probably 18 months, you're probably talking at over thirty thousand pounds. So it's a lot of money. But again, when we go back to serving your clients, it's always been again for me about investing in. If I'm working with a client and I think, oh, I feel like there's something missing in what I'm being able to offer them here, where can I source this? Where can I learn this? What can I do? So from a learning perspective, there's been nothing I would say. What I would say is I've recently invested with Lisa Johnson on her Launch Genius course. So that was, um, there's about 12 of us on that. And with that, we are on what's called her One to Many because I know for me, I'm very comfortable on that one-to-one basis. I'm full. I have, you know, a full client base on a one-to-one basis, but I want to branch out obviously into that one-to-many to to reach more people um, as such internationally as well. So for me, investing in Lisa's course and already, even now I know the difference it is making in my business, even in the last six to eight weeks it's making a massive difference in my business, much more strategic, um, you know, and building my list and everything else as well. So for me, I already know, because I'm launching a new program in September, Narcissist Free School. So for me, I want to make sure that I get the launch right with that. I know the program is going to be great as such, but it's the launch aspect of all of that. So for me, I've invested a lot in learning, but from an entrepreneur perspective, you know, this this already I know has been a great investment for me. Oh my God, girls, this has been a good conversation. I hope that everyone listening has kind of felt like they've had a little bit of a fly on the wall and that we've kept it kind of real for you. And really, again, to everyone listening, I am so grateful that you tune in. I'm so grateful that you tune into my episodes, that you tune into my guest episodes. And these two lovely ladies have been on my show and I'm sure they will be again with a slightly different angle and a slightly different take. But I hope you've enjoyed that kind of, that fly on the wall feeling of of what it really means to get a business out there. So um, girls, I want to just give you a chance to give maybe a parting shot of advice that you would give to people. um, And then we're going to wrap up. So Caroline. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I think really the, the main bit of advice for me is when people are investing in their business as an entrepreneur, 
just just take a moment to think are there any inner wounds are there is there any inner stuff that you need to work on because if we've still got inner stuff it's very hard to have the outer success that i know you, you deserve so before you make that massive investment maybe in in something moving forward just take stock for a moment and think about is there maybe some other stuff you could work on first to make that future investment even better for yourself. Mm, good advice. What about you, Catherine? Yes, yeah, similar actually. I think um, often what I see from a financial perspective is lo- a lot of people think that they need more financial education. They need to learn how to manage their tax or you know start investing or even just understanding how money operates in their business. But I'm a big believer in you've got to do the internal work first because every decision that we make comes from, or or 90% of the decisions decisions that we make come from our subconscious beliefs. And if your subconscious beliefs around money are not positive ones that are going to support your journey, then it's going to be a much more challenging journey for you. So thinking about the thoughts, what you feel about money, what you think about money, what your relationship was like with money growing up. What do you, you know? What beliefs do you have around money that probably aren't even your own beliefs? They're probably beliefs that have been inherited from your parents and your grandparents and your grandparents' parents. So actually just bringing some curiosity and awareness constantly around what do you really believe about money? Why is it important that you create this business for yourself? And getting really clear on your financial goals and your intentions, because one of the biggest challenges I see for women is that they don't know what success means financially. They don't know what they need to be earning because they don't dare look at the numbers because there's so much fear associated with money. So I always talk about bringing curiosity, gentle curiosity and awareness, getting financially naked is my kind of theme you know, getting naked with yourself, bearing all of, and thinking about, well, what does money mean for you? Why is it so important? When you hear of financial freedom, freedom from what? Freedom towards what? Actually, is financial freedom even that important to you? Or is it something slightly deeper? So thinking about you know, the, the thoughts, the emotions that then actually lead you to making certain behaviors and decisions about money is the first step. Then you learn all the practical stuff and then that's when the magic happens. Yeah, absolutely. So on that note, talking about financial nakedness, we, uh, Catherine and I had this idea a while ago that as part of my Get Visible and Bearing All and Catherine's Get Financially Naked, that we were going to do a podcast in the nude. And we were all set. We were thinking this would be an amazing PR campaign. And my 12-year-old daughter absolutely vetoed it. She said, I don't care how embarrassing you are on Facebook lives. But if you do that, I cannot be your daughter anymore. So even though that would have been an incredible PR stunt and we would have got in all of the nationals, we definitely have our clothes on right now. So um, I love, I, thank you to your daughter for protecting that. For, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that because I didn't realise that. So yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. you. We would have dragged you in too, Caroline. We would have dragged you through the mud with us. <laughs> So those of you who are listening, I hope that today you've got a bit of a flavour about what it means when you have support and what it means when you go out, you reach outside your comfort zone and find the people that you are meant to be around because it's so true in what Napoleon Hill says. I can't remember his direct quote and I've had a glass of wine, but it's along the lines of find the people that make the difference that are going to lift you up. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'd love to hear what you think of this and whether it's given you a real eye opener and that's it thank you so much for coming on the show tonight girls it's been a it's been really good and what a nice way to celebrate 100 episodes oh, Take well, care. Done. To that. Yeah. well done so I just wrapped up that episode and we just had a moment to reflect on this interview and Caroline's a little bit disappointed that she didn't get to <laughs> do any opera singing or tell any jokes or rap so Caroline this is your moment <laughs> I don't know about opera singing or I didn't say rap I said impressions oh impressions well, who, who do you want to do an impression of right then um how about dot cotton do it let's go okay okay oh I say what a great podcast Anna. <laughs>
<laughs> I've never seen you do that, Caroline. Oh, well, there you go. You see, I see. I haven't even had any alcohol here. Okay. I, I don't think we can top that. Well, I think I, that's it. Over and out. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Get Visible. To get your free checklist on how to raise your profile and to find out about our community, go to annaparkernaples.co.uk forward slash get visible.